You know, the sermon that I'm going to preach this morning was a, a heading that I was quite nervous to preach about because there's a lot about the method that I feel that I'm still learning. So this sermon is not only for you, but it's for me as well. And before I start, I always get nervous because I haven't prayed. Prayer always comforts me. So before I start, I ask humbly that you bow your heads, close your eyes, and we'll say a prayer together. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your amazing grace. Thank you for this time together of our family. And may you speak. May I step to the back, and may you come to the front. Whatever I say may be from you. To you be the glory in all that I do. I ask this in your humble name. Amen. Christ's method alone. You know, being in ministry, ministry is not easy. Ministry gets hard sometimes. And sometimes we try and use our own ideas to try and grow ministry. But here's the good news. is Christ has a method for us to grow his work for his kingdom. Because end of the day, this is his work that we're doing. So, we know, so now we're going to move to how he grew his ministry. And you've got to remember, Christ's ministry was only three and a half years. And Avondale degree is four years. And yet he was here for three and a half years. And 2,000 years later, we're all here. So how powerful was his ministry? He only had three and a half years. Not five, not seven, not ten, not twelve. Three and a half. Some of us have been in positions longer than that. And some of us are struggling with how to grow. You know, when I came to our church here, I'll be honest, I'm quite nervous of our, of our message this morning because the last time I was here, I was preaching, but I was invited to come here and preach. See, the good thing about being invited is when you preach and the message that you preach, after your message, you can go home. You don't have to face any questions coming your way. But because this is my home church, I can't go anywhere else. I've got to come here next week. So the message that I preach, you know, not only afterwards you'll be asking questions, but when I come back. But here's the thing. The sermon today is not a deep theology or, or, or anything like that. It's just to plant, to plant a seed. It's to plant a seed in each and every one of us. Because we all have a part to play in ministry. That's why we're here in the first place. So look, so let's look at his um, so let's look at his message. In the ministry of healing, page 143, it says. Christ's method alone will give true. That's the fourth word. One, two, the fifth word it says. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bowed them, followed him. There is a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time was spent in personal ministry, greater results will be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sovereign and the bereaved comforted, the arrogant instructed, the inexperienced count, counseled. We are to, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not and cannot be without fruit. Did you guys hear what I just said? The ending bit it says, this work will not, it cannot be without fruit. So if we want our church to grow and we want to reach the people, 
our neighbors, even in church. Sometimes we come to church, but we don't really reach out to anyone. We just turn up to church to do our duties, a routine growing up at SDA. I grew up in a church. So coming to church was like a routine for me. And sometimes it can be like that for us here as well. So let's go to the first part. He mingled with people, mingled. Verse, John 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. That's how much he wanted to mingle with us, to be with us. My family, how often do we mingle with each other? How often do you mingle with your neighbors? Or do we just come to church, sit there, listen to a sermon, and then straight back out? I'm speaking like this because I'm talking to you as my family. And I'm speaking because I'm coming from a place of care. This week, this week has been an interesting week for me. Um, in my role as the chaplain at Griffith University, I get an opportunity, I got an invitation um, from the, the, Brit, um, the Brisbane Synagogue, the, Brit, the Jewish um, congregation that invited me and a number of um, the multi-faith to come and to commemorate. So it's a night, they call it the, the night of the bloke, broken glass. It was in November the 9th, 1938. Um, Jewish shops and businesses and houses uh, were broken into, destroyed. So this night was the start of the Holocaust. So it was a very sobering um, experience when I went there. But mingling. And I'm part of the uh, a faith, multi-faith, Queensland faith community um, team. And I went to the synagogue with two Catholics and two Islamic leaders. And these are the leaders in their own church. And it was an experience. I met a young rabbi. Oh, no, that's just a photo of me. I seen, I was there, you know, sitting, growing up in church and reading about the um, synagogue. Where was Jesus found when he went missing? In the synagogue, in the temple. Growing up, hearing about these stories in scripture, it's the synagogue, and, and that was my first time there. And I was just sitting there trying to take it all in, and, um, and it was, it was a, an experience. And also the Jews, I always hear the Jews in scripture, but I've never actually met or hung out with any Jews. So that was the first time I actually sat amongst them. And yeah, it was an experience because they were talking about something about the Holocaust. Now, it's something that I just watch documentaries, movies, and I hear but from a distance. But sitting there with them, it was a different experience when you actually sit with the people that actually have family members that was involved, that were affected. And so this was uh, one of the speaker. She's a PH graduate from UQ, I think. I think the same one that Rena got hers. And she was speaking about um, hate speech. That there was a saying that sticks and stones don't break my bones. It may break my bones, but word can't affect me. She's trying to go against that. That, that words does affect you. You know, sometimes, yeah, when we meet people, our words, our words can do more harm sometimes than anything that we can do. And so that's what she was speaking about, that our words, that to be careful of the words that we use, to be kind. So that was her speech. The brother here, the old man here, was four years old when it happened. And he was there. 
And, and he was telling us how just that night, it was a horrible thing for them. And it was just the beginning as well. Um, so, yeah, he was four years old when it happened. And so um, that's the bottom. So the synagogue is two levels, the bottom level and the top one. So in the Jewish um, custom, the men and the ladies don't sit together when it comes to doing um, religious things. So the men sit down the bottom and the ladies sit at the top. I'll show you a photo at the end of this. But because it wasn't a religious gathering, they all sat together. And I can just see their faces, you know, how much it affected them. And my heart went out to them. There was another um, brother that was sharing the same kind of story. He was, he was there also when the beginning of the Holocaust started. So that was the theme, obviously, of the evening. And that was a, a humbling experience to be there. Some of the family members that were sitting next to me. Um, and, yeah, they all had the same stories. And just to be there was, was an experience. So this is the part that I was speaking about. To the top bit, the blue chairs, so that's where all the ladies, um, the women sit. And the middle, the bottom bit, is where all the men sit. I think in, in the Islamic um, tradition is the same too, that the women sit separate to the men. So imagine when we come to church and the men sit at the front and the ladies sit at the back or vice versa. You know, I think in those beliefs, they, they always, uh, the places for the two genders are, um, are quite significant. So, so that was my experience this past week. A couple of months ago, through the multi-faith connection, um, I was invited to go to the parliament house. They asked us, all the leaders of the multi-faith, they had the Islamic, once again, the Catholics, um, Latter-day Saints, uh, monks, uh, Buddhists, you name it. They were all there. And so when we met at Parliament House, they, were, they all went up and had a prayer. It was a multi-faith prayer. Every time they meet, it's a beautiful thing, to be honest with you, to see. You know, everyone getting along. You know, in other parts of the world, as you guys know, there's no way uh, a Muslim can be sitting next to a Christian. But going with them and, you know, and, and afterwards when I finish praying, I always, say, I always go up to them and say, Thank you for the prayer. Thank you for the prayer. You know, the prayer that they prayed. There's part, some of the media that was there, some of the um, uh, politicians that came and sat in. Um, and so, yeah, just to experience that, mingling, mingling with different people. That's who Christ would have mingled with. So this chair here is a chair, it's called the Queen's Chair. So when the queen comes, that's where she sits. So no one sits there. So where they were speaking, if I go back, so her chair's on, her chair's on the right-hand side, my left or your right. So that's where her chair sits. And so, um, so when she comes to Brisbane or Queensland, um, that's where she sits. And this is a Islamic prayer mat. When I first arrived, I seen, I seen the, the leaders standing there, and I seen this mat. And I said to the brother, man, that's a beautiful mat. And he turned to me and he said, here, yeah, brother, you can have it. And this is before it even started. Mingling with people. Mingling with people. People that we, the thing about mingling is you go out of your comfort zone to mingle with people. Because when, Sometimes we just want to go and, and leave. But the connections. So after my time at the synagogue and after my time at Parliament House, I got a prayer mat from one of the Islamic guys and, and at the, um, the synagogue, I got all their numbers because they wanted the photos that I took. You know, taking photos is a beautiful thing. I know about, you know... Um, uh, privacy and everything, but sometimes taking photos is, you know, it, it becomes a, a memory 
If I didn't take these photos, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to share these things with you guys. Um, and also when Doug sent out his, um, his email, I seen a nice photo last week of the guys out with the picnic that we had last week. And I thought it was a beautiful thing, you know? So photos is a good thing, don't be shy. It might be the last photo someone takes of you. That we've got memories. So, so anyway, me, um, mingling. That, and that's the first part. The second one is he desired their good. Church, do we come to church and desire each other's good? Desire their good. The feeding of the 5,000. Found in the book of Mark. Mark 6, verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Compassion. Desire for their good. How many people that don't look like us, dress like us, speak like us, sound like us, do we desire for their good? Or, or is it only people that look, look like you, do things like you, act like you, that you desire good for? Christ's method is a challenging one. Because it's something that pulls at your heart. That puts us in our place, really, when it comes to ministry. And here's the question, why did you think that when Jesus spoke, there were a multitude of people who wanted to listen to him? Why is that? Why did you think that wherever he was, if you read if you read his story, wherever he went, a multitude of people would follow him? And my question is, why? Why did they all follow him? The answer is because they knew Jesus would do whatever he could to help them. They knew that Jesus cared, desired for to care for them. For their good. The next one is show sympathy for their problems. The word sympathy means with pathos. In other words, it means to be someone or alongside someone while a sympathetic frame, frame of mind. It implies mingling with them in their sorrow or difficulty in a way that shares their pain with them. Sympathy. You guys know the story of Martha and, of, uh, and, and Lazarus? He says in that story, Jesus wept. He just didn't just, he didn't just turn up. He sympathized with them. He wept. Now, weeping isn't just a normal cry. He felt the pain and the hurt because he sympathized with them. And also in Mark 10, 13, 16, coming from an event like that, but even the little children, the kids, you know, the disciples were getting annoyed at him with the kids, but he said, let them come, because in heaven, be like children. And Jesus blesses the children, and he took the children in his arms, placed them in his hands, and then, and then blessed them. Sympathy. Next one is minister to their needs. Minister to their needs. You guys all know the story of the wedding that took place. It's found in John 2, 1 to 12. 
when the wine ran out. Jesus knew it wasn't his time. But who, who, who gave the request, though? His mom. It showed the relationship that he had with his mom. As much as he had and he knew his calling, he knew his place of his mom. That even though he knew it wasn't his time, but when mom asked, he did it. And what happened? Water turned into what? To wine. Met a need. Met a need. There would have been great shame on that family if their, if their water, if their wine ran out. Because I think their weddings goes on for five days, I think. Yeah, and Irina's wedding was only one day. And after one day, that was it, I was done. You know, I was like, nah, that's it. Five days. Five days. Met a need. Minister to their needs. And this is what happens when all those things mingled, desired, met the need, and then this happens. One day of confidence. One day of confidence. And you guys remember the story of the centurion that went to Christ and asked him. And Christ said to him, I'll come with you. And what does the centurion say to him? He said, you don't, all you got to say is the word. He said, Jesus and the centurion, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word. And my servant will be healed. Not only faith, but he had confidence. Christ, through his ministry, won the confidence. So whatever he said and did, they'll believe him. And the last but not least, as he asked them to follow him, Now, you remember the calling of Simon? They went out all night fishing, couldn't catch a fish. But when they came and Jesus was preaching, and Jesus used his boat to preach to the people, and after he preached, he turned to Simon and he said, go further and put your nets down again. And Simon said, we've already done that. We've caught nothing. But just the way Christ looked at him, he obeyed. And he put the nets down. And what happened? A miracle. They needed two boats. So many fish. And then after that, he asked to follow him, told him to follow him. And it wasn't just Simon, it was a few other boys. I think James was there as well. But those are the steps, my family. My prayer is may his method be the blueprint for South Brisbane Church's ministry. What do we need, what do we need a method for? He's already, he's already got one. And here's the thing. Christ spent 80% of his ministry of his time mingling, showing sympathy, ministering, and winning confidence. He spent 80% of his time doing that. And he spent 20% inviting people. 80% mingling, meeting needs, sympathizing. Because through all of that, we will win people's confidence. And when we do that, we won't have enough chairs here at South Brisbane. I mean, we're stuck with the parking, but I'm just saying the chairs at the moment. You know, this is his method. This is his church. We are his people. So that's my prayer 
for our church. Moving forward, is that may every department that we have here, may you consider taking his method on. And may we all continue, may we start mingling with each other, supporting one another, and being there, sympathetic, desiring each other's good. Because when that, happen, when that happens, when we follow these steps, our public evangelistic events only have so much influence as we create by our association. The only way we will have an, a successful evangelistic event is by our association. The people that we associate with, that those are the people that will come here. And that's where the best results will come from. So once again, family, that's my prayer, that may we mingle, desire the good for others, show sympathy for their problems, minister to their needs, thus win their confidence, and then we ask them to follow him, follow him. May the good Lord bless our family, and may he grow our Brisbane in an unusual way. God bless and thank you. All right, let us pray. Lord, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your amazing grace. Thank you for your method. Thank you for sharing of your family. And Lord, a special anointing on South Brisbane, that may your method be a blueprint here, that may we be like you, Lord. To you be the glory in all that we do. Forgive us of our many sins. I ask this in, I ask this in the name that's above all names. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I humbly pray. Amen.